So first of all, I will get the ball rolling and I would say I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, thank you for spending your afternoon, your Wednesday afternoon with us. Uh, and this hour, the third session of the Facets of Health Humanities. Um, and uh, as you know, we are looking at the different artistic productions and looking at their specificities to see what they offer to the study in the area of the health humanities and how we can best work with them in this area. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by Prof uh, Professor Chiara Battisti from the Department of uh, Foreign Languages and Literature at the University of Verona and Professor Antonio Manuel Duarte from the Faculty of Psychology at the University of Lisbon. And they're going to speak both of, going to speak about the graphic novel and comic, uh, comic books um, from the literary and psychology perspective. But however, before we begin, there are just a few technical details. The first one we've already mentioned, these uh, lectures are being recorded because we have often had people ask if uh, it is possible to have access to them afterwards because they cannot attend at the time they are occurring. So if you do not want to appear on the screen, um, you, you put, turn your camera off and, um, uh, but, but the, the, will be, the lectures will be available on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, also, um, I, I could ask you to mute your, as Rosella had said initially, to mute your mic so that there's no interference. Um, uh, but of course, there will be time for questions after the lectures. So you can either uh, raise your virtual hand so that we can see that you want, that I can see that you want to ask a question or send, or alternatively, you can send the question through the chat if you don't want to uh, appear on the screen. And uh, then just at the, uh, another thing, our next lecture will be on the 30th of May on film. Um, on the, I beg your pardon, the 30th of June on film um, and um, for this, and then we're going to take our summer break and we will resume uh, at, uh, at the end of September on the 29th of September with Professor Jason Cazal, who is going to speak from the University of Lisbon, who's going to speak on life writing. So our next event will be on uh, the 30th of June uh, on film. And, the first, and then we will have our, our summer break, and then we will have our first session in September on the um, 28th, uh, 29th of September uh, on life writing. Um, just as an aside, uh, some of the students have asked if they can have a certificate of attendance or participation. And yes, you can have, you just need to request through the Il Petrescu um, uh, email if you want uh, this. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker who is Chiara Battisti. Um, Chiara is uh, the associate, associate Professor of English Literature and the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures at the University of Verona. Her research interests include, include intermediality, fashion studies, gender studies, disability studies, and law, and law, literature, and culture. She is a member of the Associazione Italiana di Linguistica and also of the Associazione Italiana di Reti e Literature, uh, the Center for European uh, Modernist, uh, Modernism Studies, and European uh, uh, Society for uh, the Study of English. And uh, today she's going to present uh, a paper which is Beyond Words in a Time of Healing and Magic, Graphic no no uh, Novels and Alzheimer's. So Chiara, over to you. Thank you, Cecilia, for, for your kind presentation and thank you to all, all. So my aim here is to analyze the connection between illness writing and graphic novels. And in order to do so, I'm now sharing my screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? Can you see it? Okay. And uh, so in the first part of my paper, I will shortly introduce the long debate on the inadequacy of language to describe what it is like to be disabled and to represent pain and suffering. I will then focus my attention on the graphic novel as a medium 
to overcome the limits of words and literary communication. And finally, I will offer examples of graphic novels describing the experience uh, of Alzheimer's, and in particular, the graphic novel uh, by Paco Roca and Dana Wara. So the first part, the limits of language. In a reflection on the limits of language, in describing illness, I cannot by mention, uh, but mention Virginia Woolf and her essay on being ill written in 1925. According to um, Woolf, language has been utterly inadequate to give the experience of illness, the dignity of representation it gives to every other um, universally human experience. As you can read in the PowerPoint, uh, Virginia Woolf um, writes that there is a poverty of the language um, to express um, um, uh, to express uh, issues connected with uh, illness. According to Wolf, it is uh, not only a new language that we need, but a new hierarchy of the passion. Love must be deposed in favor of a temperature of uh, 104. Jealousy give place to the pangs of sciatica. Sleeplessness play the part of the villain and the hero become a white liquid with a sweet te uh, taste whose name is Chloro. So this essay has been written half a century before Susan Sontag landmark volume Illness as a Metaphor. Sontag's subject uh, in this volume um, uh, is the unreal uh, use of illness as a figure of metaphor in our culture. Sontag's analysis of illness as metaphor focuses on metaphor of cancer. And in this case, we are dealing with biomilitary metaphors. Uh, for example, she beats cancer. We hear patients say, we are going to fight this. And uh, she also focuses her attention on tuberculosis because tuberculosis historically has been considered a disease afflicting creative mind. Ten years later, in a sequel, uh, Sontag turned her attention to AIDS and its metaphor, and we are in 1988. Anyway, her point is that illness is not a metaphor and that it would be better to avoid using metaphorical language when discussing illness, as you can read in the quotation. I'm going to skip uh, reading uh, the quotation because of uh, time. Um, because of, of, of time. Uh, any other, many other authors have further explored the negative aspect of this use of military uh, metaphor. According to John D uh, Diamond, the whole battlefield vocabulary suggested that the cure for cancer had a moral basis, that brave and good people defeat cancer, and that cowardly and undeserving people allowed, uh, allowed it to kill them. Defeating cancer becomes an active rather than a passive matter. This more active attitude intended to empower those who suffer create instead another dangerous expectation. The patients, rather than be viewed as suffering, are now expecting to fight, struggle and defeat the enemy that is illness. But there is more. Some writers have stressed that Sontag's intellectual approach keeps her and her readers distant from the actual experience of disease or injury. Leonard Kriegel, for example, while admiring Sontag for changing the writer's approach to illness, finds that she's too distant from her own struggle with cancer, too analytical and impersonal for my taste. Most of the available literature on illness takes the form of, um, of what author Frank has defined restitution narrative to describe stories following this plot line. Yesterday I was healthy, today I'm sick, but tomorrow I'll be happy again. According to Frank, this triumph narrative is widespread, widespread in popular culture. As an alternative to these narratives, some authors try to focus more deeply on the dark side of the experience of illness. The task, however, is, as uh, Kathleen uh, Coway uh, assert, to find a language that can represent the illness experience, particularly those aspects of illness that are, um, that are underrepresented in the triumph narrative. A language able to describe physical pain, emotional suffering, the way bodily damage affects the self, 
and especially these aspects of illness that seem indescribable, indescribable like grief, despair, and terror. In uh, The Body in Pain, Ellen Scarry explores the reason why physical pain can defeat language. Physical pain has no referential content. While people feel love or hate for someone or hunger for something, physical pain is without an object. Scarry argues that it is precisely because it takes no object that uh, it, more than any other phenomenon, resists objectification in language. The human expression of pain or suffering often resides in the utterances of wordless sound or a word whose sound is its significance. Let's now add another piece to our puzzle and consider the medium we are dealing with today, graphic narratives, as a possible means to overcome the previously mentioned limits of words, language, and literary communication in describing illness. As, easily, as Hilary Schutz uh, has observed, increasingly the complex representation of illness and, it, and its effect is finding a home in the medium of comics. And the question spontaneously, spontaneously arises. Why is the comic medium appropriate and now so widely um, used for representation of, of illness? For reason of time, again, I cannot address the question in detail. I will then try and offer some suggestions that should, of course, be investigated uh, more thoroughly. I would like, uh, like by, um, I would start by mentioning the following um, quotation. In their attention to human embodiment and their combination of both words and gestures, comics can reveal unvoiced relationship unarticulated emotion, unspoken possibilities, and even unacknowledged alternative perspectives. The words, um, combination of both uh, words and gestures, unvoiced, unarticulated, unspoken, unacknowledged, highlight how one of the con consequences of the combination of words and gestures represented by images is to short circuit reason and to address the labile element of the self, speaking to the emotions and organizing the unconscious. On the one hand, these interaction of words and images allow the separate symbolic meanings of text and image to take on new meanings, and on the other, the very act of seeing and uh, more precisely or more precisely uh, more precisely of seeing both images and handwritten words, which becomes also images. So this very act of seeing introduces standpoints outside the rational context. And uh, Schutt again notes, comics conveys several productive tensions in its basic structure. The words and the images entwine, but never sympathize. The frames, which we may understand as boxes of time, present a narrative, but the narrative is threaded through with absence, with the rich white spaces, or what is called the gutter. The gutter is the vertical um, gap between the two uh, panels. Comics shape stories into a series of frame moments, moments and this um, manifest contouring creates a striking aesthetic distance. Yet, this distance is counterbalanced by the act of reading and looking at the text that is entirely handwritten, which creates an, an intriguing aesthetic intimacy. So as you can say, we have many productive attentions. Put differently, um, graphic narratives are a formally inclusive genre. That is to say, they work with a specific uniqueness through the integration of the, uh, the visual language of sequential images that combines words, panels, that is to say presence, and gutters, that is to say absence, iconic images, speech, and thought balloons. And it, and it is precisely this hybridity or cross-discursivity of the medium that makes graphic medicine the ideal approach not only to narrate, embodied condition of illness and of disability, but also to visibilize, if I can use the word, the experiential realities of illness condition. A much needed terminological clarification before going on with, with my analysis. What is uh, graphic medicine? 
Graphic medicine as an academic discourse was established by Ian Williams, an English physician, with the creation of a website, graphicmedicine.org, in 2007. We can also try and find answers in the Graphic Medicine Manifesto, uh, 2015, which is a creative collaboration uh, by six pioneers of graphic medicine, whose essay and comic narratives introduce readers um, to the principle of, of this field. In um, the comic introduction to this volume, uh, so the comic introduction to this uh, volume features avatars of the authors, uh, these are the avatars, um, who offer definition with different nuances of the term. So according to the authors, graphic medicine is a unique means of interrogating the representation of physical and emotional signs and symptoms within the medium, as uh, Ian Williams um, assert. Um, in, in this definition, the term comic embraces a variety of verbal, verbal visual forms such as illustration, collage, drawing and picture books, among others, obviously graphic novels and comics as well. Um, and again, uh, we have another definition uh, um, by Susan Squier. Susan Squier um, is this. Um, uh, graphic medicine offers a more inclusive perspective of medicine, illness, disability, caregiving, and being cared for. Indeed, as a manifesto, you can see the, the manifesto here, as a manifesto, the project resists the idea that there is one universal subject, one universal experience, or one universal uh, point of view. Um, graphic medicine is um, a growing community where many people have found their voices. Then the genre rewrites the biomedical and cultural representation, underscoring a specific disease by merging, as you can read here, by merging the personal with the pedagogical, the subjective with the objective, the image with the text. So graphic narratives are particularly apt for bodily narration of mental and physical illnesses, should suggest that uh, the cross-discussive form of comics is apt for discussing traumatic events. Images in comics appear in fragment, just as they do in actual recollection. This fragmentation in particular is a, prom a prominent feature uh, of traumatic memories. Graphic novels hybrid uh, four makes them aptly for bodily narration precisely thanks to its uh, capacity to represent narrative and materiality simultaneously. Not only is um, the visualized body central to comics, but the medium itself is a literary inscription of embodiment since, as Chut uh, points out, the form is largely a hand-drawn form that registers the subjective bodily mark on the page. In other words, comics puts the book, uh, puts the body on the page, making the genre specially apt for to exploration of the consequences of human embodiment, um, disability, dependency, and care. Nowadays, there is uh, so now we are now arriving at graphic narratives and Alzheimer's. Nowadays, there is an increasing attention to the subject of Alzheimer's promoted by films and literary works. A common trait of many of these representations is the sometimes unsuccessful attempt to challenge dominant Western cultural construction of this illness that is stigmatized as marked by loss of self and death before death. According to Rebecca Bipek, these cultural representations are shaped by larger ideologies supported by the, uh, the, the contemporary biomedicine that makes Alzheimer's a culturally determined phenomenon. As you can read at the very end of this quotation, by defining personhood on the grounds of rationality and cognitive capacity alone, people with dementia become known person. However, Cross-cultural studies offer different cultural and social understanding of the disease that reveal the non-universal cultural meaning inscribed to it. 
while, um, while still acknowledging the symptomatology linked to the impairment of Alzheimer and its seriousness, there are, all, there are also different social and cultural construction of the disability uh, Alzheimer, which involve important repercussion on society's behavior towards people suffering from, from this disease. And in order to consider this cultural challenge, I will investigate now Paco Roca's uh, wrinkles, 2008, uh, and Anna Wirth's uh, Alice Alzheimer, Alzheimer's through the looking uh, glass. I will um, shortly explore how these texts exploit specific aspects of the medium to offer a vision of life with Alzheimer's that tries to undermine how Alzheimer is imagined and understood in Western culture. Uh, so for, um, for my analysis of uh, Pakuroka, I'm in depth with Benjamin Fra Fraser, sequ uh, Sequencing Alzheimer's Dementia, Pakuroka's graphic novel, Arugas. So let's consider, first of all, the title, Wrinkles. So Wrinkles points to a visual metonym for, for senescence. Wrinkles are the most visible uh, signs of old age. They accompany the aging proce process. As such, the title calls the attention from the very beginning to the physical consequences of aging, thus suggesting that we are dealing with the material process whose effect can also begin to impact the brain and through it, the mind. The protagonist of Wrinkles is Emilio. This, this is Emilio, an elderly man suffering from Alzheimer's whose son and daughter-in-law uh, daughter feel they can no longer care for him at home. So the story begins um, as they decide to move Emilio into a transitional care facility where he meets um, a group of character, characters and finds a dear friend in his new roommate, uh, Manuel. Again, there is much to say, but time is tyrant. Therefore, I will offer a couple of examples to consider how Ro um, Roca's graphic novel, in its description of Alzheimer, exploit formal aspect of the medium, closure, the gutter, and in particular, word image combination, uh, in order to, um, to, to describe the experience of Alzheimer. So, first element. The link between senescence and Alzheimer's disease is made directly uh, in the text in a sequence where Roca allows a doctor to explain the disease to Emilio and thus simultaneously to the reader. Roughly halfway through the work, Emilio has begun to suspect that he has Alzheimer's and he decides to speak with the doctor. The doctor states things directly, Emilio, you suffer from Alzheimer's, before describing the disease for him. As you can read in the two panels in the third row, here, so the, the two last panels, Alzheimer is a form of senile dementia. Dementia signifies a loss of mental function, language, the capacity to reason. And then uh, in, the first, in the first panels of the next page, now then, Alzheimer is a specific type of dementia, the most common accounting for about 60% of all cases of dementia. This clinical perspective serves as a valuable instructional or educational purpose for readers who might not be familiar with Alzheimer's disease. The informational definition articulated by the doctor, who, and this uh, must be stressed, is a minor character uh, in, uh, in the graphic novel, orients readers to the gen general symptoms uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Note, uh, however, that although the clinical perspective is important for understanding Emilio's situation, Roca chooses not to build the graphic novel around the medical understanding of the disease, but rather to contextualize that medical view within the everyday lives of people living with it. From this perspective, perhaps more interesting are the events that prompt Emilio's question to the doctor and the visual presentation of, of how he receives this information. So first, the, the visual presentation of Emilio's uh, reaction. Um, in this case, Roca exploits the formal properties of comics in order to describe Emilio's subjective experience and emotional response. In the sequence showing uh, the discussion between Emilio and his doctor, these formal properties emphasize the emotional weight that Emilio's re uh, realization has placed on him. 
his reaction to the news that he has Alzheimer's is, shows, is shown to us indirectly through seven su successive point of view panels in which we see only Emilio's legs and feet against the bench of the, the floor. Uh, we have the, the first three panels here and then the other four panels. Um, so Roca uses uh, seven separate panels rather than an, extend, uh, an extended or a single panel to emphasize how this information has immobilized a medium. In doing so, the graphic artist is maximizing a primary representation property of comics, that is to say, comic uh, iconic uh, redundancy, so as to underline Emilio's reluctance or even inability to accept this bad news. The position of his legs and feet remains unchanged throughout the sequence, further communicating the moment of shock he is experiencing during this conversation. His final question to the doctor in this sequence, and with time, I will end up on the second floor. The second floor is the floor in which there are residents requiring assistance. So uh, his, um, his question um, is, may, uh, is met with the doctor's silence. A cut in the scene um, then leads into a sequence where Emilio and Miguel, Miguel contemplate the stairs to the second floor, a symbol of, of, of the future that awaits um, Emilio in his um, later stages. Let's now consider the events that prompt Emilio's question to the doctor. Uh, first, at the cafeteria table, Emilio is often in a position to watch Modesto, um, a man suffering from Alzheimer, and his wife, Dolores. At a certain point, Miguel leans over to Emilio and says about Modesto, he has Alzheimer. Sorry, I, I only had the original version in Spanish. Here, what is worth observing is the portrayal of the moment uh, within two frame, frames that functions as if they were cinematic shot, counter shot. Also, there is a curious parallel construction that adds a further meaning to the, to the reader reception of the scene. There is a visual parallel between the character of Modesto, the character of Modesto and the character of Antonio. Two long panels sits uh, one over the other. In the first, Emilio is on the right with his friend and helper uh, Miguel on the left. Below, Modesto is on the right with his wife and helper Dolores on the left. The two panels simulate shot counter shot um, from Emilio's point of view, and their parallel construction suggests a parallel life trajectory. So the destiny of uh, Emilio is um, the same destiny of, um, of uh, Modesto. Then we have another sequence. Emilio and Modesto receive each other's medicine by mistake, and the nurse says, Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Modesto and you both have the same medication. At this time, during, during a moment of clarity, Emilio understands what this really means, that he, like Modesto, has Alzheimer's. And for two frames, his eyes are op open widely. There is a key difference between the two frames. In the second one, the beige paint on the background wall behind Emilio suddenly becomes bright yellow. This um, uses the graphic property through which uh, background environments in comics become expressive of subjectivities. The sharp change in the background speaks to a sharp change in Emilio's mental state. Okay, I'm now moving to, to the other um, graphic novel, then a war at Alzheimer's, um, Alice's Heimer, Alzheimer's through the looking glass. And for this uh, part of my analysis, I'm that uh, with um, this, um, this essay, Magic and Luther, Graphic Medicine, Recasting Alzheimer's Narratives, and then a war at uh, Alice's Heimer, uh, Alzheimer's through the looking glass. Alice Heimer reconstructs the Alzheimer's disease experience of Alice, war at mother. Unable to imagine her independent and self-reliant mother in a memory care facility, in 2008, Wara took uh, the role of a primary caregiver and in the process of caring for Alice, um, Wara tried to create a bond with her to redo the past, fill the hole, and tried to make this missing, uh, the missing pieces of their past into more than ideas. And first of all, again, the title. Um, 
um, it immediately evokes uh, Lewis Carroll novels, Alice Adventures in, in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and what, the, uh, what Alice found there. In British philosophical literature, citations and metaphor derived from these well-known novels, novels are so frequent that they lead the reader mm, and me to think mm, that the specific choice of the title contains in itself an allusion to a world in which the laws of nature and logic are turned against themselves time and time again. In that universe, the complex negotiation of Alice's personality, personal identity is at stake. Alice's adventures in Wonderland constitute an introductory lesson in the intersubjective nature of identity because only by losing her subject position does she become aware that she had one. Therefore, the cultural universe evoked by Alice in Wonderland suggests a beyond Wonderland for the contemporary Alice painted by Dana Warwick. A beyond which foregrounds dementia, sorry, dementia as a different way of being, as a window into another reality, which cultivates alternatives to the biomedical and cultural figuration of Alzheimer's disease. To present these alternatives, Worth exploits a specific element, the use of collage form, positive lexical choices, and the creative appropriation of Wonderland, on which I will focus my attention. Technically, <clears throat> Alice's uh, Heimer is not a comic in the sense of sequential art. Uh, in the novel, on the left uh, hand pages, there are images and on the right, um, short descriptive text. To be more precise, the memorial is divided into 26 prosby necks, reinforced by black and white collage drawings. Worth clarifies, if you page through Alice's Heimer looking only at the left hand pages, you can read the original comic, A Love Story in Picture. I started writing short vignettes, each one in response to ones of the original drawings. So as you can see, the emphasis in this sentence is on uh, images as the essence of her memoir, on the description of its content as a good humored story, on the characterization of Alice's Heimer as a love story in pictures. In general, Alice's Heimer is a collage text which integrates multiple materialities and different elements, such as photographs, hand-drawn images, and cut pieces of Alice to convey the coexistence of conflicting uh, realities um, of Alice's uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so I'm going to skip um, and uh, um, so and, and uh, to analyze three. Um, three um, collage. The first one is Flying Sun. Um, often Alzheimer narratives dramatize the coma state or, del or delusions of Alzheimer disease patients and emphasize the toil of the care given. In Alice's Heimel, Warath intentionally departs from such representation, the pic uh, describing at the very beginning of the story, drawing at the very beginning of the story, Alice flying like a bird in the midair, reaching toward the sun, thus suggesting a visual sublimation of Alice's degener uh, degenerative memory into her ability to fly. And this paves the way for viewing Alice from a different perspective. Uh, then Alice and disappearing Alice. So in, in this part, Alice is described um, as an old woman with a round face, curly hair, um, cherubinic features, and a halo embracing her uh, whole body to signify, as Sheila Mac uh, McMullin suggests, her reversion to childhood and her altered magical state. Although Warat uh, depicts the disappearance of Alice, and so uh, she provisionally immerses uh, her readers in fear, then she reassures uh, her, um, her readers that uh, Alice is not losing her tangible parts, but only her memory. Just losing her memory, the part that kept her grounded. To visually illustrate Alice's loss of memory or her ungrounding, as Warrat describes it, the author draws Alice's feet above the ground, leaving the heart and eventually flying. The collage in the chapter titles Flight and Alice Ungrounded depict Alice as a superpowered woman who confidently flies towards the light. 
In flight, Alice is in midair, moving toward the sun, um, as the readers learn of her special power. In other words, the idea that Alice is slowly disappearing is destroyed because Warraf strategically separates the notion of self from the determinative, the determinative role of memory and thus provide a sharp contrast to the already mentioned um, Alzheimer's disease discourses that construct cognitive function as a central and defined characteristic of the self. In the last collage, and I'm, um, I'm my conclusion, Worth depicts a peacefully sleeping Alice who embraces a variety of her own selves the caption reads, I know who I was when I, uh, when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. The sentence is borrowed directly from the caterpillar in, um, in Wonderland. But while in uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice, it had a negative connotation, for Worth, uh, for, for Worth Alice, it has a positive value, helping the reader embrace the now of AD um, Alzheimer's disease patients. This now is a living multiplicity of selves with merges past, present, and future. Thank you. Uh, Chiara, thank you so so much for this really uh, really uh, interesting and insightful um, uh, talk. And um, again, you kind of showed us that in one way we are we think of the prevalence of of, of the literary word, but that many times uh, other media can offer more uh, valid uh, uh, presentations. So I'm sure there will be many, um, uh, many, many questions afterwards when we open for questions. Um, in, the meantime, in the meantime, we will move over to Professor Antonio Duarte, who it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Antonio Duarte, uh, who is also my colleague at the SHARE project. Uh, Antoine Duarte is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Psychology of the University of Lisbon, uh, where he teaches and uh, performs research activities in the fields of educational psychology and psychology of art. Uh, he has taught at several universities overseas under the Erasmus program and has several publications in books and articles in national and international journals. Um, belonging to the, the, the editorial board of uh, scientific, several scientific journals as well. Um, he has part participated in a number of funded research projects supported by entities that include uh, the European Commission, the Portuguese Foundation uh, for Science and Technology, and the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. He was a member of the Scientific Council of the Faculty of Psychology of the University of Lisbon, and he was a consultant at UNESCO and the Organization of Iberian American States. Currently, he's a member of several research, international research projects, including the CHAIR project, Health and Humanities Acting Together, which is based at the University of Lisbon. And this afternoon, he is going to present a talk on the rationale and use of comic graphic novels in the health humanities. So, Antonio, over to you. Thank you, Cecilia. So, I'm going to share also, if I can, If you wait, wait, wait a moment. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, make you also. Yeah. Rosa, uh, um, okay. Uh, you should be off now, and so you should be able to, to share your screen. Okay. Uh, just one other side thing, Antonio, before uh, you go over. You just have to have a look out as well to see if people uh, want to enter the room because you have to let them in as you're now the host. Okay. 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 So. Can I, should I start then? Yes, please do, please do. Oh, thank you, thank you very much to Cecilia for, for this invitation. Uh, also, thank you to Chiara for the sharing uh, on these thematics and thank you to the um, Pietrisco uh, team for the, this uh, organization. Um, so, um, this uh, presentation is, um, about um, a rational and use of comics and graphic novels in health humanities. I'm sorry, let me, okay. Just a 
minimize So in the, in the framework of uh, health humanities, this presentation aims to articulate the rationale and use of comics and graphic novels for the development of an attitude of patient-centered care in caregivers and uh, an adaptive psychological response to illness in patients, besides their decentering, receiving of empathy, and articulation of their experience of illness. So I, I should tell from now on, I will use the word comics to refer both to comics and graphic novels, just for practical uh, reasons. Um, such use of comics that I'm going to tell you about consists of an extended generalization from a previous tested procedure that used cinema. This procedure comprehends the involvement of caregivers in the analysis of movies in the thematic of health to develop the main aspects of an attitude of patient-centered care, namely the consideration of the patient's needs and desires, sharing of power and information with the patient, proximity and support to the patient, and sensitivity to the patient characteristics and life story. Specifically, caregivers are introduced to strategies for analyzing films that represent healthcare based on the psychology of cinema. For example, attempting a psychological analysis of characters. The use of such, such strategies is exemplified to caregivers and used by them individually and among discussing groups in contrasting movie scenes that present caregivers manifesting patient-centered care versus behaviors that somehow dehumanize their patients. So what you see here in the slide is a, an example of two scenes that we used for uh, in this procedure. One is from a well-known movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and the other is from another movie, Wheat. And as you can see from these scenes, we have two contrasting attitudes from the nurse to the patient. Um, the rationale of this procedure is both the known advantages of an attitude of patient-centered care and the positive effects of the appreciation of aesthetic narratives in the development of competencies based on humanized care. The, the proposed use of comics in health humanities that I'm going to tell you about can be grounded not only on the rationale of the mentioned procedure that uses cinema, but with three, three extra components. The first component is the advantages of an adaptive psychological response to illness for at least some patients. Such a response involves a set of patients' attitudes and behaviors like hope, problem-focused coping, learning about illness, support-seeking, altruism, or epiphany regarding life priorities. The main advantages of this response are improvement in adherence to treatment and to behaviors that help to regulate illness, the enhancement in the sense of control of the patient, a reduction in the typical detrition of a new medical illness or hospitalization, and in possible loneliness. Improvement in mood and in a sense of purpose, a reduction in the perception of daily things as so stressful, and finally, motivation to positive life changes and th therapeutical alliances. The second component of the rationale is the richness in the multimedia language of comics and the psychological response to them. The processing of comics involves the construction and coordination of both verbal representations, which are more abstract, and visual representations, which are more concrete, through the selection 
organization and integration of information obtained by different perceptual subsystems. The processing of images will be more emotional here, occurring fractions of seconds before and more intensely than that of the corresponding words, which will be of a more rational level. In fact, images are more intense than words to communicate subverbal psychological states, such as emotions, which are nonlinear, inaccurate, and diffuse. For example, seeing a character's facial expression or body posture is more impactful than reading a description of her psychological state. The processing of characters' emotion through images sorry, will thus be closer to how it happens in real life, improving its processing through words and symbols. On the other hand, the later will help clarify or deepen the perception of emotions through images, which may not be enough. For example, reading that a character is confused or seeing a spiral in a balloon that expresses her inner state is more informative than seeing a disturbing facial expression. Thus, in the reading of comics, there is probably a complementarity between the visual processing of the characters, which as in real life are opaque, but intense in the manifestation of behaviors and emotions, and the verbal and symbolic processing of them, which makes them transparent when unveiling their thoughts and feelings. Moreover, comics might facilitate identification of readers with characters due to the schematism and simplification in which these are often represented. Considering the third component of the rationale, this corresponds to evidence from the efficacy of comics-based learning defined as the changing of attitudes, knowledge, and competencies as translated in or through that kind of language. Empirical research, research shows that comics-based learning can tend to involve a high degree of motivation, possibly because through images and compared to the simple text, it increases emotional involvement, enhancing reception and facilitating the memorization of content. Besides, comics-based learning tends to increase the understanding of mediated concepts by allowing the association between text and image. Reducing the requirement of reading dense text, comics can reach resisting readers, and while combining literature with the visual arts, they are suitable for a variety of literacies, particularly facilitating the learning process of individuals who, having more difficulties in linguistic processing, are more fluent in visual processing. Studies indicate that the multimedia effect, namely the beneficial effect on learning to process verbal, written, or sound content associated with images, is replicated for the reading of comics, since compared to the pure text, this modality can contribute to a greater understanding and to a greater interest of the participants in learning. As evidenced in experimental studies, the reading of a content in the form of comics can facilitate the integration between observations and critical reflections derived from concrete experience with abstract conceptualizations. In addition, the complementarity of the verbal and imagery representation mode can contribute to a reduction in content ambiguity and also to captivate readers. The reading of comics involves a variety of complex psychological responses to this type of art, mostly grounded on the basic cognitive processes of attention, sensoriality, perception, memory, comprehension, and interpretation. From knowledge about the most relevant of these cognitive responses, a set of analysis strategies, uh, meaning the intentional uh, procedures of analysis, can be derived 
for, for the previewed use of comics in health humanities. Next, these psychological responses are shortly presented together with an example of a strategy derivable from each one, illustratively applied to selected comics and graphic novels in the thematic of care and illness. So a first relevant psychological response to comics, to comics is related to the cognitive process of attention. Through experimental eye tracking observations, there is evidence that at the beginning and at the end of reading a comic page, readers distribute their attention in a global visual search. At the beginning of reading, such attentional pattern can help determine the direction of reading and check the importance of the elements, while at the end, it can help make new connections and check that something important was not missed. Between the initial and final phase of reading of a page, there is an intermediate phase of reading with a more selective attention to specific elements of the page from which information is extracted. Several eye tracking studies suggest that this selective attention tends to fall on the characters and their parts with emphasis on their faces, enabling the processing of their emotions compared to the backgrounds as well as in the specific clues on sequential meaning. From this response, it can be derived the analysis strategy of having a general view of the comics page before and after a selective attention to his elements with a special emphasis on characters and corresponding expressions. The use of this strategy can be exemplified on the reading of a page of Say Hello to Blackjack, a Japanese manga that narrates the problematic professional integration of a young doctor, Saito, in a dehumanized hospital environment. This particular page is part of a story about an old patient that is neglected by the hospital. So a first general view of the page allows an understanding that Saito, the young doctor, confronts an older established doctor about the issue. A subsequent selective attention to the character's faces and eyes, facilitated by their magnification, permits a discrimination between Saito's here, Saito's, um, sorry, I lost myself. A subsequent selective attention to the character's face and eyes, facilitated by their magnification, sorry, permits a discrimination between Saito's patient-centered care attitude and the other doctor's opposite attitude. Lastly, a final general view of the page allows confirmation of the main reading. Another pertinent psychological response to comics is linked, is linked to the cognitive process of perception. The perceptual response to a comics page consists of considering it not as an image, but as a structure composed of multiple subunits, the frames, which are supposed to be read in a certain order. I should mention that this, the, the order of reading varies according to, to the culture. And if, if we go for manga, the reading normally goes from um, uh, right to, to left in a kind of uh, uh, Z. And uh, in Western comics, it goes from, uh, like in reading in general, from right to uh, from left to right, sorry, in a in a in a S in an S uh, pattern. Uh, consequently, the reader will be involved in the cognitive complement of the narrative by um, deductively imagining what occurs in the gutters. So I, I just remember Chiara already told us that the gutters are the empty spaces between frames. Um, so imagining what occurs in the gutters also allows the perception of time and movement in the narrative. From this response, an analysis strategy of intentionally imagining what happens between frames can be deduced. 
For example, in a page of um, The Bad Doctor, a graphic novel that narrates the daily life of a British doctor, one can see in a page, I show you here. Okay, sorry, this is in French. So the doctor says, uh, come on in, Mr. Brown. Well, how, how things are going? And then it proceeds. Um, so from, um, um, so uh, as you can see, there is a first frame um, that the, do the, 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 the doctor is at the door welcoming a patient. In a second frame here, the second frame, um, there is the face of a person, and then there we can see a pair of closed hands, in inducing us to imagine that between these two frames, the patient entered, seated, and closed his hands with his posture. In the third frame, there is the face of the doctor, and then there we can see another pair of hands with the same gesture, opening to our imagination that between frame two and three, the doctor empathically mirrored the posture of his patient. Okay, move, moving on, an associated psychological response to comics um, involves sensory uh, processing, which in this case will probably be multi-sensory due to specific conjugation that comics make of image, which appeals to vision and text, which calls to hearing. Uh, further, multisensorial processing is probably uh, also present in the cognitive feeling of getters. Uh, for example, in the reading of a sequence of frames, such feeling might, might, uh, may imply the imagination of images, sounds, textures, and even smells that are not actually represented, of course. In addition, reading here, implying the reading of typical speech balloons and above all onomatopoeias and iconic images of sounds or smells probably involves frequent experiences of what is called pseudo-synesthesia, which consists of imagining stimuli from stimuli of different sensory modalities. For example, imagining a sound from a written or drawn symbol or imagining a smell from an icon that um, expresses um, a certain olfactory um, feeling or sensation. From multisensory processing, it can be extrapolated an analysis strategy of intentionally, intentionally imagining not only what can be seen, but also heard, touched, or smelled between frames. For instance, in a page of Old Doctor A.T. Still, I show you the page here. So it's again in French, which as you probably know, it's an important language for comics. Um, so what, uh, if, okay, even if you don't read, you can understand what's, what's happening here. Um, um, so in this page, what we can witness is the last moments of a resigned bedridden patient um, depicted, depicted in a sequence of frames. Um, so what I want to point out here is that besides actively imagining hearing the voices involved in the written dialogue, a reader can intentionally imagine in the last gutter here, so the, the gutter between the, the two last frames, uh, uh, we can imagine hearing the, uh, not only in the voices, but in the last gutter of the page, the sound, eventually the sound of the patient's last breath and the last dislocation of his warm hands. So you, well, you can see here the, the, the man, both men hold their hands together. And here we see that the hand of the whole man dropped in, 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 in the in the blanket, so we can imagine that between them there was this movement, and and we can also, of course, um, have a kind of um, of synchronization with the emotional uh, 
aspect involved in this in this last uh, in this last uh, injection. Um, another relevant psychological response to comics is allied to the cognitive process of memory. So understanding um, comics involves a dynamic involvement of the reader's memory. Actually, such reading in, implicates the activation of um, prototypical personal knowledge that allows the construction of a cognitive structure appropriate to the comics domain. This structure or model remains in working memory th throughout reading and then uh, is archived for the future in long-term episodic memory. The understanding of narrative here is thus partly based on the knowledge and recognition that the readers has, uh, that the reader has and makes of objects, for example, characters or artifacts, also of situations, for example, interactions in contexts, and narrative patterns that organize them, for example, beginning, middle, and end. For this, it can be extrapolated an analysis strategy of intentionally associating what is read with personal knowledge and experience. An illustration I would like to give you on the use of this strategy for the reading of of graphic novel, 1001 Nights of Urgencies, I show you here, where, um, where uh, in a certain page, an hospitalized patient receives from the doctor, uh, from a, one of the doctor's books and music. I'll show you the page here. So there is a reference to several uh, authors and, and books, um, and also to, to music. So what I would like to, to point here is that um, from, from um, uh, uh, in this, um, in this um, the, the for, uh, illustration of, of this strategy that relates with memory, um, is is that the uh, the the reminiscence uh, this provokes the reminiscence of how books, music, and films can be used to console for the long hours of a personal convalescence. So um, everybody with an experience in with a long experience in the hospital probably easily could could easily empathize with this patient and bring back from his own memory. The, the importance of this kind of material for, for, for dealing with the long time that is spent in this, in this situation. So, okay, this is an example that would, would be more proper to, to patients, but there is also a doctor involved. So I think that the material is a bit eclectic and can be used both for, for staff um, and for patients, or maybe uh, uh, as we, as we did in a in a first experience, me and Cecilia, uh, with with um, medical students that were joined with uh, humanity students, and this was uh, an interesting experience of mingling uh, a group uh, that um, uh, or two groups that came from different cultures and had different roles regarding um, caring and and uh, and being cared. Um, uh, okay, moving on, a variety of psychological responses integrate the comprehension of any comics and its different elements. Uh, um, so considering the specific aspect of the comprehension of characters on comics, it seems this performs like a kind of multimedia comprehension. Actually, comprehension of characters on comics is probably based not only on their behavior and accompanying text, but also on the graphic style in which they are represented or on the iconic express, expressive images of their psychological states within thought bubble, or even on their backgrounds. Uh, Chiara already mentioned this with an example that she gave in the first presentation. From this, an analysis strategy can be derived of intentionally analyzing comics characters on the basis of their behaviors, speech, graphic style, through bubbles and backgrounds. 
An exemplification of this strategy can be made by recurring to the graphic novel Crazy Health Log by Posla. Um, I show you here. That testifies the author's hard experience with Crohn disease. This is an interesting example because he is an author of, um, of graphic novels and he went through this, um, this, um, this disease and he decided to do a kind of graphic diary where he portrays himself and how he dealt and the difficulties he had with this, with this disease. Uh, so considering a page where the patient is depicted in an hospital room through a door just opened by a caregiver. I, give, I show you the page, this is the one. So analysis of the patient's behavior, lower torso and head, hand supporting body weight, uh, his speech of complaint, and especially, uh, this is what I want to stress here, the irregular lines by which he is represented and the scratched black background, all of these concur to the comprehension of his desperate psychological response to illness and to his caregiver's negligence and discredit. Because what we have here is also um, an attitude that is of discredit by the caregiver, so we, which we can, we can analyze in terms of a dehumanization and the feeling of, of a patient that, that finds himself not well, not well understood. This is, a, this is actually a pattern that goes through all this uh, graphic diary of, of Posa. I think I, I'm almost um, uh, in my deadline, so I will, I will, uh, I will just give you a, a very short notion of uh, another process that, from which we might derive another strategy. This is interpretation, and this deals mainly with the fact that while reading a comics, of course, we have the ability of um, um, elaborating a critic of uh, what we what we read, and from these critics, from these critics, uh, we can also derive the strategy of uh, um, uh, imagining how we, if we would be the author of the comics, how we would reconstruct it in order that he clarifies the um, the message we think he wants to clarify. So the last example is from Daryl Cunningham, Psychiatric Tales which by coincidence deals also in this case with dementia. And as you see, we have the doctor realizing that he did something that is not adequate to the patient. And then he corrects, the patient wants to go home and he, has, he shuts the door on her face. And then it says, I'm so sorry. Okay, so there is a reflection, a correction, but the reader might find that this is not enough and might Imagine how the how the doctor should do in order to have a, a more patient-centered attitude in this specific um, situation. So, the, concluding very very shortly, as an art form with a specific language that prompts a rich appreciation process and that facilitates the changing of attitude, knowledge, and competency, comics lend themselves to be used in health humanities. One form of such use could hand the development of an attitude of patient-centered care in health caregivers and the development of adaptive psychological responses to illnesses in patients, besides helping them to decenter, receive empathy, and articulate their experience of illness. These targets are envisioned under the awareness of several factors that might act as obstacles or limitations, like individuals' readiness and willingness to change, personality, experience, coping style, aesthetic taste, or the ethnic, um, uh, also, also the family and professional culture uh, where they are immersed. Nevertheless, it is anticipated to reach the aim targets, at least in some individuals and settings, by involving both caregivers and patients in an oriented analysis of comics in the thematic of care and illness, through a set of practical procedures that nevertheless need testing and improvement through experimental research. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's it. Thank you, Cecilia. <laughs> okay. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, Antonio. 
Um, uh, that's right. Maybe you could unshare your screen. Excellent. Um, um, okay. Well, Chiara and Vanya, thank you both very, very much for such um, interesting and they, your presentations were short, but they were full of detail. Um, I was. I have a two, uh, and what I thought was one, it was wonderful the way you also showed the the use or the potential of comics for patients or carers or and in Antonio in your case uh, in healthcare professionals. And um, I actually before I open the floor for questions for, from the group, I have uh, one question for both of you if you don't mind. Um, that is um, how not everybody feels uh, equipped to produce um, a graphic novel. Like, for instance, do can you or panels or sequences? Uh, could either of you suggest, like Chiara, in your situation when you are working mainly with carers or with um, uh, or, or with the patients themselves? Antonio, in your case, working with healthcare professionals. Uh, can you think of, uh, have you any ideas about how uh, they, uh, they could be instructed to, to produce these materials to act as a form of ex ex expression for themselves? Kiara, I don't know if you want to start. As you like. <laughs> Well, I, I just I just want to mention that my my the perspective I just presented you is more focused on appreciation than on creation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. This this this, this I, I I I understand, but I I was also fascinated by yeah. Yeah. The, the, poten the potential for production. Yeah, um, I was in a recently. Um, after the invitation to, to elaborate this presentation, by chance I was in a presentation on also on the topic, but not 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 with the, with the same um, theoretical context of health humanities, and um, this is where I, I I knew the work of Posla, the 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 drawer that made the the graphic diary with Crohn's disease. And someone asked him in the end um, if um, if he considers. Of course, he, he has the competences because he's a professional um, cartoonist. Uh, but someone asked him if he considers to serve also as an illustrator of uh, people that don't have this competency, um, but uh, could use his uh, pen in a way of um, expressing their story. So this could be a, a possible solution. Uh, it, the language of comics seems easy, but uh, it's not easy at all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's not easy from the perspective of the creator, of course, uh, because it, it deals with a lot of technical aspects that Chiara knows better than me. Um, but from the point of view of the one who appreciates is also not intuitive. There is a conception that it's very easy to read comics, but this is not at all like this, because um, the, when we read, for instance, manga for the first time, uh, first, we don't know how to read it probably, and we don't understand what's the narrative. So this means that we need experience within, we need a kind of learning in order to appreciate it. Yara? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I start from the assumption that obviously there are different media and different individual sensitivities and abilities, and these can make um, someone lean uh, towards one or the other. But as pointed out in my presentation, uh, um, the use of the term comics embraces a variety of verb or visual uh, forms, such as, uh, as I have already said, illustration, collage, and drawings. So for example, uh, collage is perhaps easier to, 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 to use as, as a tool. And um, I haven't had time to, to mention it, but Warlock, the author of Alice Heimer, asserted that she chose the collage 
precisely because her mother, Alice, um, liked uh, the use of collage um, in, in, her, um, in her time period. So, um, and this is um, an idea. But I would add other element. Um, each of us could see long before we could speak. The four visual skills, in this sense, I'm not talking about creation, but of using a graphic novels. Um, visual skill long preceded the acquisition of language. Pictures also came before words. Uh, let's think about uh, the earliest uh, cave paintings, for example. So the oldest form of writing, of communicating, were indeed Victoria. Um, and the very fact that images and graphic narratives are able to, um, uh, to, to tap into our subconscious processes are important for both the composer and the reader. And again, my emphasis is on the readers in this case. Um, but what is also important to, to stress is um, it is precisely this tapping into subconscious pro uh, process that gives graphic storytelling its power. And this power can heal and support caregivers, for example, and because healing is not the same as curing. Healing involves creating shared social meanings. Uh, and so in this sense, they, they are uh, useful. So I don't know if I have answered your question, yes. <laughs> no, 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 you have, you have, you have, definitely. It's very interesting. This, yeah, and collage, yes, this makes really a, a lot of sense because it, it overcomes the difficulty that Antonio was, uh, was referring to. Mm. Um, okay, so has, are, has any, are there any questions from the audience, from the public? I, I have a question, I have a question. Um, mm. It's uh, for both really. Um, I mean, it's, uh, thanks very much for both, you know, very interesting, very engaging um, and, and complimentary, I suppose, um, uh, presentations. Um, and what interests me is actually the way you read the comic, Antonio was, um, Telling us a little bit more in, in the answer to, you mm -hmm. know, to the question, to, to, to Cecilia's question. And, um, you know, because um, you actually had a really clear slide of, um, you know, how cognitively we look through our uh, vision, you know, through our eyes at, you know, uh, space basically in front of us, you know. So and you also mentioned that mangas are written, are read differently from. Western, obviously, um, we are uh, trained in different ways in, in the different cultures, you know. Um, but um, it kind of brought me back to, you know, when I was presenting poetry, because also poetry has a very different mm -hmm. way of being read on the page. And I wondered if you had either thought or studied or have any um, comments basically on uh, the similarities between reading poetry and reading um, graphic uh, novels um, on the page basically and how meaning and significance of the text uh, can can make sense you know for who reads um, you know in, in, in a similar or in a different way between the two different uh, media and genres uh, that was my question yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to start, yeah. So it's, it's a difficult question. Now, um, so I was thinking about the metaphysical poets and the use of, of, of the form of the poem in order to, to add extra meanings uh, to, to the poem itself. Uh, and, for example, and also, hmm? I was going to say, you know, just if it could maybe also add an extra, because I saw in, in some of your slides, Chiara, you had uh, collage that uh, were very similar to Apollinaire's poems, for example, mm. you know, all the, the kind of um, uh, the drawings, the circles with the, yeah, whatever, you know, that that was. So I wondered if maybe this helps <laughs> in a way with the answer. Yeah, I, sh I should, I should think and work perhaps uh, on, on this. Yeah. Maybe. If Maybe what what I could add to the question uh, has to do with um, how 
how graphic design of text uh, um, is a factor in reading. And um, okay, I don't know much about this, but I know that there are studies that compare different graphical designs um, and um, measured the impact of these different designs in, uh, for instance, reading comprehension. Um, uh, with, uh, with the appearance of electronic texts, there, this, there is also a concern that the, um, the visual aspect of the text, uh, also in terms of uh, if you read from paper or if you read from a screen, how these um, might influence. Nevertheless, uh, that never, okay, that, so there is, I know there is empirical research about this, but I can't tell you much. Anyway, uh, what I was thinking is more speculative. And I was thinking in terms of what happens when we read visual poetry. So in visual poetry, the, there, is a, there is an intention manipulation of the, the visual aspect of the text in order probably to combine um, the, the, the visual processing of the reader with the, the semantic processing. Anyway, re reading, reading is always visual, of course, because we look, we look, at, we look at designs of, of letters and words. Um, nevertheless, um, with visual poetry, I would say, but this is, this is just an hypothesis, but I would say that probably, probably some of the mechanisms that are involved in reading comics mm -hmm. also, also generalize to reading visual poetry, for instance, we, when we look at the page of a visual poem, we, we, we probably start by having a general um, attention uh, before we, re we start to read it. So first we have the general image and probably then we go to a selective attention and to a semantic uh, processing. And maybe we also finish by having a general um, view before we move to the next page. So, I would say that probably there are common aspects, uh, especially in, 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 in with, with, uh, with visual poetry. And it would be an interesting <laughs> hypothesis to test, um, to check uh, also how, the, how the, the, the visual aspect of the text has emotional impact or, or how, the, how this emotional impact aligns with the emotional impact of the, of the the, the the verbal message yeah i agree because um um like for example i was thinking of a time when i was teaching uh film uh, uh, subtitling and mm. um, you know the way you subtitle is very much connected to the way your eyes yeah. read but also focus and we don't mm. read necessarily in a very orderly way, we go back and forward, and then there's always a, a, a couple of words somewhere in the text that, that catch your attention. And I wondered if maybe a graphic novel was con constructed in a similar way as well. Is there a point in the page or a couple of points in the page where you pick up your wor the words before and keep them much more in memory for the following? Um, you know, so th th that's quite an interesting aspect to that maybe, I don't know if it's been studied because I, I know, I don't know very much about. Uh, the, 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 it has been, it, it's studied mainly with this eye tracking. Yeah. So with the, with the eye tracking and, and okay, directly answering your question, we know that we know that the attention tends to go to certain parts of the page. It, uh, it, the same with painting, when we look at a, but a painting, we know that there are certain certain points of the painting that attract more the attention. What is interesting is probably artists know this in, in, in an intuitive way, intuitively, and and um, and somehow they try to manipulate our reading and our attention uh, in a way that can be more or less successful. Yeah. That's that's also an interesting perspective on. On the creation of comics, because we somehow uh, okay, I, I know this is biased because I'm from psychology, but I I, I think for in psychology of art there is this tendency to look at the the artist as a kind of intuitive psychologist, 
So someone who knows how the reader reacts and then makes things in order to manipulate between brackets, of course, the, the, the reaction of the reader. Yeah, also because in, uh, in the case of comics, we are dealing with different um, elements. I mean, we have the panels and the different shapes of the panel can um, invite reader to focus the, um, their attention on, on a, a specific part of the page. We have uh, the thought balloons and uh, speech balloons, and also the shape and the position of, the, of them can uh, attract the attention of uh, the readers. So uh, you have to consider all the different elements of the test. We have words, handwritten words, but we have also nomatopoeic words in which the shape um, uh, again, can uh, focus the attention of, of the reader. So, so all these different um, elements um, can create um, or, or should be considered when dealing with this um, with, with this question. Yeah, uh, I was thinking as well when you're speaking here, because in cinema, for instance, we have the rule of thirds so that everyone knows that the central, so the screen, the, the director knows that they give the division of in thirds, and then the horizontal and the, and the vertical. Um, and so, but it is a much simpler medium uh, than comic book, as you're saying, Chiara, because in the comic book, you have the manipulation of the size of the panels and the shape of the panels. So you have the same shape of a page, but that page can be divided in completely different ways to achieve different uh, effects. And like, as you showed with your panel, which is the one where you had, when, when, um, when your character understands that he has Alzheimer's and the background changes all of a sudden, you know, where we've gone from a very, uh, you know, this is just, and of course, this will stand out no matter where it's kind of positioned on the page, I think, but this manipulation. Uh, do you think yeah. That, yeah. It's wonderful. You know, it's really, and to, I just uh, another question coming on from Rosellas, and I'm going to stop asking questions, but I was just thinking of like these young poets, like the slam poets now, like I'm thinking of Rupi, uh, Rupi Kuri, uh, the Indian Canadian poet. I don't know if you know, but where she writes, she's, uh, she writes her poetry, but she also illustrates it and uh, performs it. Uh, um, uh, when you, uh, this comes from your, when you were talking about the, the sensor, the, 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 the effect on our sentiments, how poetry uh, is, is changing and moving uh, in this way um, and being illustrated, which is something that we don't associate with classic poetry. But sorry. So I, I was just thinking how, like, the, the barrier between poetry and the graphic side is is even being blurred by these new poets who are illustrating their poetry, okay. uh, which was something we kind of associated with children's poetry before, but now is moving into the mainstream. I'm 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 seeing uh, Ruby Kaur now. Yeah, yeah. This is the advantage of 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 the decent presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm manipulating. Kaur. Yeah. Um, are there uh, are are there other questions? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's full of uh, possibilities of thinking. I, I, yeah, sorry. sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't catch uh, Christina. No, I say, I say it was a very interesting lesson. Okay. Uh, okay. Very, very interesting. To think about. <laughs> Okay. I just wanted to add that um, it seems that, you know, the way we've actually been presenting in different um, areas um, is really well interconnected because if we think of graphic novels tonight with poetry and cinema that you're going to do in June, uh, Cecilia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we have, we have really ways of um, 
uh, you know, just find some common areas, common ground between all of them. And, and, and that's really interesting. Uh, so um, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed learning a little bit more about a, a new area that I didn't, I didn't know anything about other than reading comics and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, whoever it was like Snoopy and, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't, you know, I still get confused sometimes on how you should be reading certain things, but uh, it's really interesting. It's very, uh, thanks very much for uh, opening my horizons. <laughs> Mm. Yes. As you did last time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. No, uh, I agree. It, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful session. Um, I, I, I learned things I had no idea of, and a whole new respect for graphic novels. And uh, you've opened our, our eyes to the potentiality of them as well. So, uh, Chiara and Duanio, thank you so very much for, for this. Um, and I think we'll close the session now. We're on to quarter to uh, quarter to eight, so <laughs> it's time to let people uh, get on. And in, in Italy, it's an hour later, so I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in May and the session on cinema, which will be on the 30th of May. And uh, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Very much. Good night. I don't know who has the commands, but maybe you could yes. actually close. Antonio. Antonio, if you just leave the meeting and uh, end okay. the meeting. Okay. Ciao to everybody. Okay. Thank you, Antonio. Okay. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.